Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. I know that there are some fellows who will be joining us over the next couple of minutes as they leave their work responsibilities and come to their famer responsibilities. So they will be popping in. But we will go ahead and dive in and they can join us as they're able. For those of you who do not know me or maybe have forgotten my name, my name is Mary Beth Scallon. So my given name is Mary Beth. My family name is Scallon. However, over the years, my given name has gotten shorter and shorter. So now people call me MB. Maybe in 10 years, I will be a single letter. I do not know. Uh, that is a joke that some of you have heard before. So please feel free to call me MB. I am delighted to be with you this evening to talk about communication skills. And there are just a couple of housekeeping things before we begin. I would like to take a comfort break, a prayer break about halfway through our session. But I know around seven o'clock Cairo time is not the perfect time for a prayer break. So I propose that we take the break at 7 p.m. Cairo time, but I am open to other suggestions. Would anyone like to suggest a different time for our break? It will be 10 minutes long. Any other ideas? All right, so we will plan. Oh yes, we have, Ahmed says that's good. All right, we will take our break then just a little bit before seven. Thank you for your flexibility. And of course, if you need a few more moments um, at the end of the break, Take the time that you need and join us as soon as you can. That is excellent. So first of all, I want to thank everyone at the Famer Regional Institute in Cairo. I want to thank Hekmat and Magdalene and Shaima and Zainab. I also want to apologize for my terrible American accent, pronouncing your beautiful Arabic names. They are excellent. And throughout this process for the past few years, they have been wonderful guides to help me serve you as best I can. So many, many thanks to them for their efficiency and their professionalism. So today we're going to examine the idea of nonverbal communication. So all of us are very good at using language. You would not be in the positions you are in if you were not good at communicating your ideas with words. But we also communicate with our faces, our vocal tone, our vocal quality, with our bodies. And that is an area that is often unconscious. So the communication, the messages we are sending out with our bodies, with our faces, with our eyes, we do it instinctively. But as some of you have heard me say, one of my jobs at FAMER is to take an unconscious process and bring it into the conscious mind so that then we are able to make decisions about it and to deliberately and consciously grow our skills in that area. So today we're going to examine nonverbal communication. And as some of you may know, my primary profession is that I am a professional stage actor in the U.S., I do anywhere from two to five productions a year on professional stages. I am obsessed with nonverbal communication. It is extremely interesting to me. I hope by the end of this session, it is also interesting to you. So let us quickly summarize the different parts of this session. This session has four or five lessons. I want to briefly go through them. The first lesson is asynchronous. It is mandatory, so I would love you to do it if you have not done it yet. That lesson is called body messages. And in that lesson, you learn about congruous messages versus incongruous messages. So a congruous message meaning when the face, the voice, the body, and the words are all sending the same message. An incongruous message is when the face, the body, and the words are sending different messages. And often incongruous messages can distract and confuse listeners. Good for us to know as educators. 
There is an optional asynchronous lesson. If you have time to do it, great. If you don't, that's okay. That one is called body influence. That one examines how we move and pose our body can actually influence our thoughts and feelings. Very interesting, provocative. Please take a look at that if you can. Another lesson is hand gestures. I hear many educators say to me, I don't know what to do with my hands. That lesson is all about how we can support not only our self-expression and our culture in our hand gestures, but also the meaning of what we're saying. All of that leads us up to, leads us up to our synchronous lesson today. And this lesson is all about how do we grow our skills? How do we become better communicators? That's what we'll look at. So first, I'm gonna share my screen here. I wanna take a look at the core question of this entire session, all these lessons put together. What are we really exploring here? So hopefully my Wi-Fi will play along. And here is our core question. So please read through this. And what I'd like to point out here is there are many communication workshops for educators about how are our communication skills affect our learners. But I'm not just interested in that. I'm interested in how our communication skills affect ourselves as communicators. If I do not feel confident in my communication skills, that will affect my ability to stand in front of a class and deliver my message truly effectively. So I'm interested in not just supporting our learners with good communication, but in supporting ourselves, giving ourselves more confidence in what we're doing. Here are our goals for this session. So please read through these. And today we're going to focus on the first three of these goals. The last two, I will ask you to focus on individually in a very short lesson at the end of this synchronous session. There's one more lesson on Moodle that I'd like you to undertake. It would take you 10 to 15 minutes. It's very short. And in that lesson, you will assess your individual strengths and challenges and you'll brainstorm how to use some of this content for your own learners. So now, let us dive into our first big chunk of content. How can we take charge of our nonverbal message? I want to study something called body shape. So now I'm going to bring you back to me. I'm missing all your faces. There you are. So when I say body shape, I don't mean how fit you are or how beautiful you look in your clothing. What I'm talking about here is the overall shape we make with our bodies, which is essentially a whole body gesture. We are communicating, sending messages with our body thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of times a day. So if we as educators can really begin to understand what messages we're sending, we can make choices about those messages. And those messages can become another educational tool. So we all know that how we think and how we feel affects our bodies. For example, if on a given morning, I have a fight with my husband and then I go into work, my colleagues will say, are you all right? You look a little down. So clearly, my thoughts and feelings are influencing my body, and they can see that I might be a little like this. But does it work the other way around? Can we actually influence our thoughts and feelings by what we do with our bodies? I want to explore that a little bit with you. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to take on a specific body shape. I will demonstrate it for you, and then I will ask you to assume the body shape with me. Then I'll ask you to maintain that body shape for one minute. 
while you're maintaining the body shape, I'm going to coach you to pay attention to what thoughts and what feelings rise up in you as a result of that body shape. Now, a couple of caveats. You are, your safety and your comfort are far more important to me than any exercise. So if at any point while you are maintaining a body shape, you feel uncomfortable, if your neck is uncomfortable, your shoulders, drop the body shape. That is secondary to your comfort. So our first body shape, I'm going to unplug my headphones. So my sound is going to change, but hopefully you can still hear me. I'll demonstrate it for you first, and then I'll ask you to join me. This one will be a little hard for you to see, but I think we can get around that. I've unplugged. I am sitting. So if you are standing somewhere, please feel free to sit. My feet and my knees are pressed tightly together. So my legs are tightly pressed together. My arms are wrapped around my torso. I'm gonna adjust my screen a little bit like this. I am leaning forward. My head is down. I call this a seated fetal position. So now I invite you to join me. So wherever you're sitting, please press your knees and your feet tightly together. Wrap your arms around your torso. Lean forward, look down. I'd like you to maintain this position for a minute and I'm going to turn on my timer right now. So as you maintain this position, again, if at any point you feel uncomfortable, take a break, shake it out. I want you to pay attention to any thoughts that arise in your mind, any feelings that you might have that seem to be connected to this position. So for 30 more seconds, just observe yourself. What thoughts rise up? What feelings arise? You have 10 more seconds. If you need a break, take a break. All right, thank you. Shake that off. Get rid of that one. <laughs> Great. So let's talk about that briefly. And you can respond either by raising your hand or by putting info in the chat. I have it open right here. What did you notice? What thoughts or feelings arose when you were in that particular body shape? So Reem, what did you think? Uh, yes, uh, I, I thought uh, of uh, being isolated that I don't want any uh, external, uh, I don't want anybody to interfere with me right now. I just want to be by myself. I'm emotionally deprived. Just leave me alone. Yes. So this is interesting because essentially with our bodies, we created a kind of closed room. So our arms are protecting us in front. Our spine is protecting us in back. Our head is down. So we have become a kind of closed unit. So yes, that privacy, that please, I don't want to interact with the world, very relevant. Eman, what about you? What did you notice? Uh, I felt that I'm focusing on the position and the flow of thoughts in my mind stopped. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking about like uh, my muscle tension and I can't think about freely about other stuff in life. <laughs> yes, yeah. I understand. And that is one of the challenges with studying body position. We are so responsive to whatever our bodies do. Our bodies and our brains are communicating Obviously, our brain is part of our body, but they are so tied together that I have given you a somewhat impossible task. So, yes, <laughs> thank you for reflecting that back to me. I'm looking at our chat, and Aisha says, I am looking for protection. I am not comfortable. Um, Abdel Rahman says, sad. Yes, Marwa says, lonely. <laughs> Hani says, depressed. 
Now, interesting, Hala says calm. So this can also be a self-soothing behavior, right? So context becomes very important. And we're going to talk more about that later. Uh, Hamdi says sleepy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's try another shape. This one is standing, so I will demonstrate it for you. And then I will ask you to join me. My sound change. This one is based on my teenage nephew. So I am standing, my feet are together. One hip is cocked to the side. I have a hand on that hip. My other arm is hanging loose and I am looking at the ceiling. I call this one teenager. So if you would please stand if you are able next to your chair, and if not, that's okay. You can also do it seated. If you are standing or seated, feet together, one hip cocked, whichever one you want, hand on that hip, the other arm hanging free, and look up at the ceiling. I'd like you to maintain this for one minute. I'm going to set my timer now. And this is one that can strain your neck. So please feel free to take a break at any moment. And just observe yourself. What thoughts might run through your mind? What feelings may arise? You have 30 more seconds. Remember to breathe in this pose. And if you need a break, please take a break. And you are done. Thank you so much. You can shake that one off. Thank you for doing that. So tell me what you notice. What thoughts arose in you? What feelings might have come up? Reem, yes. Yes, uh, I I thought that I'm bored and that I have to to be spending my time in a more uh, useful or productive uh, way, and that I I'm I'm like uh, I'm wasting my time with whatever is going on now, and I have to be someplace else <laughs> because of my precious time. Yes. I enjoy that because, as I said, I have based this one on my teenage nephew mm -hmm. who truly feels that anything that is not video games is a waste of his time. So, yes, thank you for that. Um, Iman, what did you notice? Uh, I found myself smiling like I didn't smile in the first position. So and uh, I felt some sort of openness mm -hmm. or I don't know. Yeah, as a kind of a change. Like I, I like to be more open, more like feel feel like um, have some sort of flexibility in movement. I'm standing. For me, it's better than sitting. Yes, and what I'm interested in in your response is that in this posture, our arms and legs are open. They are yeah. not crossed. They are not protective. They are open. So ma no matter what else is going on, we are more open to our environment in this position. Thank you for that. Let's look at our chat. Uh, we have low back pain from Hamdi. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have the same problem. Uh, bored, Marwa says. Abdul Rahman says, proud and careless. Interesting. Uh, Hala says, I was thinking I must be annoying to the people around me. <laughs> that is very appropriate. Yes. Uh, Basha says, not interested. Right. So there is something about the visual focus, the eyes going up, that can indicate a desire to be out of the immediate environment. So not interested in what is happening here, thinking about something else. Very nice. We have one more of these that I would like to do. And this one I call superhero, and you will see why. So again, I will unplug, my sound will change. This is another standing pose. So I'm going to move my chair 
And in this pose, adjust my screen a little too. My feet are wide apart, wider than my hips. My hands are on my hips. My chin is up and I am looking into the distance. So if you would please join me, that would be delightful. Stand if you are able. And if not, you can do it in your seat. Hands on your hips, feet wide apart, chin up, looking into the distance. And please maintain this shape for one minute. And in this shape, please keep breathing. You are tempted to hold your breath perhaps, but please keep breathing. And what do you notice? What thoughts run through your mind? What feelings may arise? You have 20 more seconds. If you need a break, please take one. Very good, thank you. You are done, you can shake that off and resume your seat. So tell me about that. What did you notice? What thoughts or feelings popped up? So Hala says, I can do anything, intent. Yes, absolutely. Eman, what did you notice? Uh, I felt that I'm preparing for something great in the future. Uh, I'm a challenger. So, yeah, yes. I have a great, great yes. feeling about myself. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Hence the title, Superhero. And I'm sure you have seen in the superhero films, on the posters, there is always one person in this pose. At least one superhero on the poster is standing okay. like this. Um, who else? Let's see. We have a lot of things in the chat. Hamdi says, back pain relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I perhaps I'm a doctor. I had no idea. Uh, let's see. We have Marwa says powerful. Aisha says I am capable of realization of something. Yes. Abdul Rahman says strong and confident. Hani says greatness. Yes. So Reem, you had your hand up, and I did not come to you. What did you notice? Uh, same thing, uh, same thing. It's just that I'm capable, yes, and uh, uh, all the doors are open or, or uh, there are many options and I just have to choose which one to, to start or to pick up first. Uh, it's like, hmm, where should I go first? Something like that. Yes, yes, the world is mine. So yeah. where do I go from here? Uh, Yasmin says, strength and a little bit of arrogance. Yes, and Manal says, confident and directed. Excellent. So this, of course, was not a scientific study. But in our little exploration, it appears that yes, perhaps what we do with our bodies can influence our thoughts and feelings, as well as the other way around. And this is interesting information for us as educators. I know that I have had mornings, and I imagine you have too, where for whatever reason, I did not feel enthusiastic about teaching. I was overly tired. I had too many responsibilities. I was worried about something at home. The idea that we could use our bodies to re-energize ourselves, to redirect our thoughts and feelings could be very helpful. And there are people who advocate for posing, what they call power posing, before you deliver a speech or teach a class. The idea being that if I stand in an open, confident manner before my class begins, and then I start my class, that my thoughts and feelings will accompany the pose. I will feel more confident, more ready to teach. So that can be a fun thing to experiment with. Again, not a scientific study, but an intriguing little idea. So, now I'm interested in shifting our focus from ourselves and how our bodies affect ourselves to our listeners, our learners, the people who are receiving our messages. 
We're going to do a small group preparation, and then we'll come back together and share our findings. So first of all, many thanks to the six folks who are going to moderate for us. We have Abdul Rahman, Aisha, Mohammed, Christina, Hamdi, and Dina Syed have agreed to be our moderators. Thank you so much. So in a few moments, we're going to break into six small groups. And each moderator will receive an image. And the image is a human figure in some kind of body shape, whole body shape. So moderator, your first job is simply to share the image with your group. You can show them the photo and then I'll just take a good long look at the photo. Group, your job then is to come up with three positive and three negative messages that you might receive from that body shape. Now this can be a little difficult. For example, if the body shape that your group has received is this, it can be a little hard to come up with positive messages, but do your best. Use your imagination, think about that body shape in different settings to come up with three negative and three positive messages. When you are all done, you'll have 10 minutes to do that. We'll all come back together and I will ask the moderators to share what, what information they received from each photo. And I'll show the photos to the whole group. So I'm now going to take these instructions that I've just given you verbally and put them up on, uh, on a slide. You can take a screenshot of the slide. You can take a photo of the slide. Your moderators also have the instructions. Before I do that, and we break into our small groups, what questions do you have? All right, so now I'm going to share my screen and bring up the instructions. Here are your instructions. Feel free to take a screenshot of this if you would like. And I think for my, uh, my administrators, Hekmat and Magdalene and everyone else. I think we give folks maybe 10 seconds to take a picture of this, and then we can break into our six small groups, and we'll be in those small groups for 10 minutes. All right, I'm going to stop the share. And we'll move you into small groups. So good luck, everyone. I will see you in about 10 minutes. Oh, great effort and great job. <laughs> You're leaving the session very nice. <laughs> great. I'm so glad. <laughs> well, one thing I really appreciate about your fellows is they are very willing to try anything that I suggest. And that is really wonderful because I have in the past run into fellows who uh, do not want to participate in things that might make them feel silly. Uh, and I really appreciate that your fellows are willing to try it and just experience something a little different, a little new. Um, that is a great gift to me as a facilitator. Yes, I understand you. <laughs> We're trying to choose active fellows only. <laughs> Yes, it makes a big difference. It makes yeah, a big difference. Yes, of course. All right, I'm going to mute myself for a couple of minutes. It looks like we have about just a few more folks to get into their groups, and I will be right back. Okay, great. <laughs>
مساء الخير عليكم دكتور كريستين دكتور ايمان دكتور هاله دكتور شيرين ممكن نقبل المسج اللي هتطلع سامعيني حضراتكم أنا معلش مش سامعة حاجة حضرتك في مسج هتوصل اقبليها بس مسج واتساب يعني لا يا دكتور هنا نوتيفيكيشن هتوصل لحضرتك دلوقتي في الشات بوكس دكتور شيرين دكتور هالة دكتور شيرين في مشكلة عند حضراتكم؟
سلام عليكم هو نيتشيب صغير كده Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I see you are all popping back into my screen. Excellent. So I'm going to now share my screen and I will show each one of these photos, one after the other, and then invite the moderator whose group was studying that photo to tell us what you found. So here we'll go to share screen. And this is our first image, group number one. And I believe, Abdul Rahman, was this your group? If so, tell us what you found. Yes, uh, hello, MB. Uh, good night for everyone. Uh, actually, our group think that this, uh, this picture is full of diverse and counteracting feelings. Uh, yeah. But we can summarize them uh, as uh, a positive for the first, uh, just he um, he is looking for uh, solving a problem, huge problem, difficult problems. Uh, second, uh, he may be uh, ambitious, uh, looking for the future, and uh, relaxing, uh, relaxing in a uh, uh, wide place, uh, green trees. Uh, so, so I, I think we are. He is uh, relaxing in this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, for the yes, uh, as we go through the negative, uh, he's careless. Nothing is important for him. Uh, I, I, uh, at least like right now, he is uh, frustrated uh, for something, and uh, he could be quite desperate. Yes, this is uh, what our uh, uh, group think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Thank for you. your input. And this is a great example, as Abdel Rahman just said, of an incongruous message. So with this photo, we are receiving contradictory messages. One of the biggest indicators of body messages, one of the places that humans look right away to get information is the face, of course. We want to see someone's facial expression. So this gentleman's facial expression is very hard to read. It is very neutral. I cannot tell if he is unhappy or happy or just thinking. So that is immediately a little confusing. A second place we look for information is visual focus. Where are his eyes focused? And of course, in this case, he is looking away from us, the observer, looking to the side. That's interesting. That does not necessarily indicate he wants to interact with us. He is thinking of something else. But despite those pieces of information, another big message, or I should say messenger, that humans look to are limbs. What is this person doing with his arms and his legs? They are open. They are not crossed. He does not appear to be protecting himself with his limbs. So from his face and his eyes, we receive the message, stay away. From his open limbs, we receive the message that he may be approachable. So thank you, group number one, for picking up on that and for articulating it so beautifully. Let's take a look at another one. Number two. So I believe this was Aisha. Yes, it's mine. I'll, I'll share it. So tell us what you found. Okay. Okay. Uh, our uh, group 
uh, they found uh, as a positive. Uh, she feel free to do what she want, ready for challenge to face, or we can say she's visionary. She's thinking to do something future. Mm -hmm. For the negative, she's overthinking, absorbed in her uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's careless or she's setting a barriers. She wants to protect herself from problems or something bad thing has happened for her. And she's upset. And Thank you very much. And oh, I love a table. Thank that you. Is <laughs> lovely to look at. So again, we are receiving a series of really interesting messages from this person's face, from her eyes and from her limbs. Her face, again, it's a little difficult to discern what her expression is. Is she unhappy? Is she just thinking? But her eyes, like the first examples, are looking away. She is not engaging with us, the observer. Unlike our first example, her arms and her legs are crossed. And we tend as humans to interpret that as being protective. So there's something about this person that seems private, that seems even though she appears to be in a public space, she is having a private moment. The other thing I wanna point out with this figure is another messenger that a place where humans look for body messages is the spine. So if our spines are up and a little forward, that tends to indicate interest. In this case, her spine is down. It is collapsed down and she is um, creating a kind of protective shell with her spine and her arms. She is protecting her torso. And we pick up on that immediately and think, oh, Something emotional is up with this person. The other thing I want to point out with this figure is the idea of context. So if I said to you, this person is at a funeral, you would say, ah, that is that in, changes my interpretation of the message. But if I said to you, this person is at a wedding, then you may think, ooh, that's a whole different set of messages. So we have facial expression, we have visual focus, we have limbs, are they open or closed? And we have context. We consider all of those messages as we try to interpret this behavior. Let's take a look at our next one. I enjoy this one. So this one I believe is Muhammad, is that right? Let me see if I can, can yes. people see this or are they still seeing Aisha's screen? The same screen, the previous screen. All right, so I wonder, let's see. There we go. Thank you, Aisha. All right, so let me make sure. Let me go back and share this again so we can all see it. Great. So I particularly enjoy this person. So, Mohammed, what did you find? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this man, uh, although being uh, not interested, exhausted, bored, as a negative signs, but also he appeared relaxed, well-dressed, looked like as arranged his uh, ideas, uh, some sort of dreaming as a positive science. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, this is a particularly interesting one for me because I find him very confusing. <laughs> so we have open limbs, his arms and legs are not crossed, but look at that one foot, he is not grounded in his reality. He is, one foot is curled. That's very interesting to me. And look at his spine. His spine is back and off to the side. So sometimes when the spine is back, it can look very casual and relaxed. It can also look detached, as if this person is not fully engaged in what is in front of him. The fact that his spine is also off to the side, that sends a very very interesting message to humans. We find that a little confusing. When the spine is off to the side, we can interpret it as being very casual, very relaxed. Sometimes we can also interpret it as being rebellious or defiant. It's interesting and it always catches our attention. And I think one thing that Muhammad's group picked up on, which I appreciate, is the look on his face 
and where he's looking with his eyes, his visual focus. If the teacher is not standing on a tall pedestal in front of him, say he's in a class, then he's gazing off into the air. So the idea of dreaming comes across to me as well. And again, context plays an issue. If, if this person is in a classroom, perhaps he's not understanding the lesson. If this person is at a big party, then I really don't know what's going on with him. So he's very interesting because I find him very confusing. That's intriguing. All right, we can do a couple more before we take our break. So let's go to our next one. And this one I believe is Christina's. Uh, sorry, this one is not shared upon our, our group. Oh, I see. Uh, who has this one? The one uh, shirt for us is a uh, young uh, bo boy um, crossing his legs. All right, let's take a look. Yes, this one. This one, great. All right, yes. tell us what you found with this one. Uh, regarding the opinion of my group, um, regarding the poster points or the good impression, uh, he may be uh, relaxed, um, feeling at ease, uh, concentrating. Um, Regarding the negative points, his his um, uh, his appearance, or um, maybe uh, according to the situation, uh, uh, as you said before, if he's in a casual class, it's okay, it's acceptable. But if he's in a you uh, in um um a more uh, professional uh, scene, it may be um, underdressed, or <laughs> I don't say I don't know how to express my feel my my. Uh, uh, thoughts, but uh, maybe his clothes is not fit uh, if it is for professional uh, uh, attitude. Uh, yes. For me, for, for my own uh, opinion, as I had the, uh, I, um, my internet was uh, closed for somewhat, and uh, this boy is trying to uh, um, obscure something or or uh, hide something, and he's um, a, a little bit annoyed or ex or anxious. Ah, interesting. Thank you for those observations. And I know just what you mean, because I feel that there is something about his, the position of his legs that does not feel professional. Yes. It feels like something that you could do at a football game, but maybe not in a professional meeting. Yeah. So if we go through our list, we look at his facial expression. He looks a little worried. He's hiding his mouth. And that is a, the mouth is a big messenger to us. So we can't see his mouth. So that's a little confusing. His visual focus is on something in front of him. So he is in the room. He is engaged with his surroundings, but his limbs are crossed. So that supports this idea that Christina mentioned of being protective, maybe hiding something. Another thing that I want to point out here is another big messenger to humans as we look at other people is the level of muscular tension. And there is something about this person's hands. They look tense. It looks like he's holding them in soft fists. And that level of tension says something to me that he is nervous, anxious, afraid. If his hands were loose and open, I think it would send a very different message. So thank you very much for that, for your comments on that. And let's see, Hamdi, which shape did your group receive? Was it one of these two? No, yes, that. Yes. Uh, we, this one? we thought that this uh, beautiful lady uh, uh, is happy and caring about uh, something. You make a good contact, eye contact with the person or someone in front of her, which uh -huh. uh, reflects their uh, care about the subject they discuss about and despite that she is very beautiful mashallah but she has a severe a severe degree of genovarum and she must go for surgery now <laughs> oh my well i will make sure to tell her orthopedic <laughs> yes surgery it could also be her shoes her heels are very very high yes Thank you. Was there anything else, Hamdi, that you would like to say about her? No, thank you. Thank you. 
So what is very interesting to me about this person is that, again, I receive a bit of an incongruous message. She is smiling. Her arms are somewhat crossed. Her legs are not. So that sends me mixed messages. I can't tell if she is relaxed and at ease or if she is just a little bit nervous. And this is where another body message consideration arises. We must also consider culture. So if this person was in the middle of an American business meeting, I may think, oh, she seems very shy. By wrapping her arms around herself, she is making herself smaller. So perhaps she is not comfortable. But if this person is in a different culture, we may think she is being very modest. She is making herself slightly smaller in order to give greater attention to the people around her. So culture begins to play a real role in how we interpret body messages. She would be perceived very different in different cultures. All right, let's do our last one. I think we have one more left, and it is this person. And Dina, is this your picture? Um, hello. This is uh, was not my picture. My group was. Uh, tell me what your picture was. Group six, uh, the uh, the young men. It was one of the men. Uh, who is putting his hand on his uh, mouth. Oh, it was this guy. Okay, so you got also yeah. this one. Yeah. So wonderful. Well, tell us what you saw in this picture. You will probably say some things that we have not mentioned yet. Um, uh, one positive thing, uh, I think that he may uh, be reflecting on himself. He is uh, focusing and uh, after hearing something from the others, he is reflecting on himself, so he is thinking now. Uh, this is, uh, I think, some positive uh, thing. Um, negative one, I think he is maybe anxious or angry, or he is not engaged with uh, the surrounding. Yes, thank you very much. And this is a body shape that you will sometimes see in large public places when people are trying to create private space. So perhaps in a bus station, in an airport, he is creating a small private area for himself with his limbs in the middle of a public setting. So thank you very much for that. We are a couple of minutes away from our break and I'm wondering if it might be acceptable to you to take our break now and take it for 10 minutes. Is there anyone who would rather wait and take break in a few minutes? All right, let us take our 10 minute break now. We will regather in exactly 10 minutes at I think 7.07. .07. Cairo time. And of course, if you need a few more minutes, you are welcome to them. Thank you for your good work. I will see you in 10 minutes.
Hello, friends. We will begin to regather. If you need a couple more moments, please take them. That is always okay. Welcome back. All right, so I will dive back in and I know folks will join us as they are able. So we have now taken a look at how our bodies may influence our thoughts and feelings as the communicator. We've taken a look at messages that we might receive from other people's bodies. I'm interested now in beginning to identify the most effective body messages for us as educators. What works well for us? It has been my observation that the most effective body shapes for educators are those that indicate openness, welcome, and approachability. So that our learners feel they can come to us with questions, with concerns, and we will pay attention to them. We will take their concerns seriously. So what does that mean in terms of body shape? What body shapes appear to be most open, welcoming, and approachable? In this next exercise, I want to begin training your eye. So again, taking something that you know intuitively and bringing it to the forefront of your brain. I'm going to show you a series of slides. In each of these slides, there are two human figures, marked A and B. They are in different body poses, different body shapes. With each pair, I'm going to ask you to answer a simple question. If you were at a professional conference and you needed to ask someone a question, perhaps you needed directions or you needed to know something about the schedule, which of these two figures would you be most likely to approach? So I'd like you to answer in the chat. I'd like you to put down either A or B, whichever figure you think is most approachable looking. And then I'd like you to write something very short telling me why. So for example, I may write B, she is smiling. A, his limbs are uncrossed, etc so that you are identifying which figure looks most approachable and then analyzing why. And again, this is a way of training your eye. You will notice over the course of this exercise that the photos I show you have less and less and less detail. We will move from photos of human beings to stick figures. And this is to reinforce something I've noticed about humans, we are so good at interpreting body language that we can get enormous amounts of information from very few clues. So let us begin. I'll show you the first slide and tell me in the chat which person you would approach. We'll go to share screen again. And here comes our first image. Would you approach A or B? And why? Let me know what you think. And tell me why. So we have some folks saying, I would approach A, this person looks open and cheerful. I would approach B as she looks professional. Now, you will be biased by what people are wearing. This is inevitable. This is human nature, and that's okay. So many folks are saying B looks more professional. I think it's interesting that A has her hands on her hips, and that makes her look very playful. So if I felt comfortable with someone who is very playful, I may approach A. But B looks a little more professional a little more formal, a little more pulled together. 
And that is coming basically from the fact that even though her hands are clasped, she is smiling and she is relaxed. Excellent. Let's take a look at the next one. Which of these two would you approach and why? Would it be A or would it be B? And remember, you will be biased by what people are wearing. So in A, we've seen this model before. He showed up in our last exercise. Again, his limbs are crossed. He is looking away. He doesn't look like he wants to be approached. As Reem says, A is not paying attention. B, he's relaxed, he's open, he's smiling, his attention is directed at us. Excellent, let's try another one. Which of these two would you approach and why? So we talked earlier about how the spine sends a message. So B, her spine is upright and slightly forward indicating interest. She is smiling, she looks relaxed. A, looks like she's having a terrible day. <laughs> Poor A. So her attention is directed inward. Not so approachable. B's uh, attention is directed outward. Visual focus. And uh, Dina says, A looks like she would not be interested in what you were saying. I think that is probably true. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at another. These two are interesting because they're both problematic. So which one would you choose and why? So with A, I'm not sure what he's doing with his hands. I don't know what that's about. And his face looks a little sour, but he is facing me. His entire body is facing me. That may make him feel a little more approachable. B, his arms are crossed. He is looking away. And he's pivoting away from me. His body is facing a different direction. I am not sure that I would approach him. And Manal says none, both look frustrated. Yes, I agree. Okay, let's take a look at another one. You will notice that we are now switching from real human pictures to cartoons. I'm gonna start taking away information from you and seeing if I can challenge you to continue to get messages from these bodies. So would you approach A or B and why? So folks are weighing in on A. A looks happy and open. B looks like she's about to have a meltdown. <laughs> yes, she is overexcited, overwhelmed, says Reem. Absolutely, B looks frustrated. Very nice. Let's take a look at another one. This one is pretty tricky. Which person would you approach? The only thing that is different between these two figures is the hand position. Which one would you be more likely to going up to? So Aaliyah says both. A is more confident, probably because her limbs are open, hands on hips. B's limbs are closed. So maybe B looks a little more private, a little less confident. Very nice. Let's take a look at the next one. As you can see, less and less detail. Would you approach A or B? So B looks happy to see us. That's very nice. B's hands are open. A looks like he is in the middle of figuring out a problem and maybe he would not want to talk to us. Yes, B is cheerful, B is open. Excellent. This one is also a little tricky. The only difference between these two is the arm position. So it's a little hard to see, but A has her arms crossed at her waist. B, one hand on hip, one arm hanging down, which is a little unusual. We don't see that very often. Folks are voting for B. Now, Abdul Rahman says A, more formal, more professional. Other folks are saying B, more open. B is not shy, A perhaps seems shy. Very nice. Dina says, 
she would approach B. She feels confident and her attitude is going to be nice, but she might be kind of rude, but it's okay. <laughs> Excellent. Very nice. Now I've taken away even more information. Which of these two would you approach? It's going to be a little more challenging. We don't have facial expression. We don't have vis visual focus. People are voting for A, very interesting. Ah, yes. So Aisha says, you told us that sometimes we give ourselves hugs. That is not always a sign of non-openness. Thank you, Aisha, absolutely. So folks tend to be voting for A because his limbs are not crossed. He seems a little more serious, a little more professional. There's something about B, we can't see his hands, just like we can't see A's, but his legs are crossed in a very casual, very casual kind of stance. So most folks seem to be going to A. Marmer says, both give the impression of overconfidence. Interesting. All right, let's look at this one. Which of these two would you approach? So both are open, absolutely. For me, there's something about A that looks maybe a little overexcited, <laughs> but I don't know, I don't know. B seems, yes, B is more welcoming, but A is overexcited. This is what Reem says. B is very generous. Some folks though are saying A, A is enthusiastic. A is supportive. Excellent, I'm enjoying the chat. So Iman says they would approach A in a sporting competition, but B in a conference. <laughs> yes, and, and Aisha says the interpretation in view of the context, absolutely. So if we were at a sporting competition, either of these people would be very approachable. If we are in a business context, that changes things. Let's do a couple more, continue training our eyes. So these are tricky, even less information. It looks like A is holding up a finger as if she is making a very strong point. It also looks like she's in motion. B looks kind of braced. Yes, she is grounded, she is planted. Which one would you approach and why? Yeah, this one is trickier. People are taking their time figuring this one out. Most folks are saying B. A, uh, Dina says A because she's going to give you the information and make it stick in your head better. <laughs> Abdul Rahman says neither. <laughs> that they are both, uh, that A is threatening and B is overly proud. Iman says, uh, or Reem says A is good at giving directions. Yes, probably. All right, let's take a look at another, even less information. The only difference between these two is the arm position, but we can't really see it clearly. Which person would you approach? Most folks are voting for A. We can see her arms a little bit. Her hands may be behind her, they may be in front of her, but B definitely has her arms wrapped around herself. I am assuming the person's gender, we can't actually tell. Let's look at this one. Even less information, now we're in stick figures. Which of these two would you approach? This one makes me laugh, I just think B is funny. <laughs> neither, Iman says neither. Right, both of these folks appear to be having a not very good day. Yes, but maybe A, because A is at least turned a little toward us, right? B looks just thoroughly depressed. Abdul Rahman says, A still has some power to continue his day. Yes, thank you very much. Let's look at this one. Which of these two would you approach? So B is waving, could be friendly, could be aggressive, hard to know. A is just standing facing us. Reem says B as he is calling on me to ask him, yes. <laughs> right, so B, because he is acknowledging us, which the wave, with the wave, 
makes us feel we could approach him. Well done. Take a look at this one. You can see the images are getting a little ragged. Which of these two would you approach? Neither of them is particularly appealing. Most people, however, are saying B. A looks like he, he has the weight of the world on his little stick figure shoulders. Let's try this one. Which of these two would you approach? Most people are saying B, some folks are saying A, both. And again, context would play a, a big part here. So if we were at a party, I might approach B. If we're in a conference, I might approach A. Reem says neither because they're busy dancing. <laughs> Very well done, thank you so much. I appreciate you participating in that. Now I'm going to bring you back to me. Now that we have trained our eyes a bit on open and approachable body shapes, I want to shift. Our next exercise is going to concern another type of nonverbal communication, but I'm going to leave it mysterious for the moment. In a moment, we're going to break into six small groups as before, and moderators, I believe you have all received secret instructions. Moderators, do not share those with your group. Those instructions are only for you. If a moderator has not received their secret instructions, please let us know. So when we break into small groups, here's what I would like to have happen. Group, I want you to elect one person to be your speaker. And speaker, your job is going to be to tell your group about a very enjoyable experience that you had recently. Now, you may have to talk for a good five minutes. So think of all the details you can think of. If speaker, if you run out of things to say, get your group to ask you questions to keep your story going. So you get together in your small group. The group select, elects one person to be the speaker. It can't be the moderator. Speaker, you start telling your story. I want you to speak until we bring you back to the big group. All right? Moderators, you have a secret job. So moderators, you perform your job while the speaker is speaking. So I'm seeing that Christina says, Abdul Rahman and Christina have not yet received the secret instructions. Great. So my administrators, would you be able to send our moderators their secret instructions? Let me know if that is possible. And if not, I can dig them out of my computer and I can go ahead and send them. All right, so Aisha has not received it. Abdul Rahman needs it. So moderators uh, or uh, administrators, can you tell me if you have the secret instructions? I wanna make sure you have them. Okay, just a second, I'll um, post them and get back to you again. Great, thank you so much. And also Hamdi is having trouble with Wi-Fi, so we may need to assign a different moderator in that group. Okay, no problem. Thank you. I so appreciate having administrators who are so on the ball because this is the tricky part of Zoom, right? All right, so we'll see if we can yes. get, yeah, this is always the hard part. We'll see if we can get the secret instructions to our moderators. And we'll give them a moment to work that out. And in the meantime, I want to read a comment from Aisha. I had a moment in last week's conference. My friend introduced me to a new doctor from Tunis. He was very motivated to introduce her as she is a good person. But for me, she had a very closed attitude. No eye contact, a non-smiling face. I had a negative impression of her. But the next day she saw me in the break. She was kind, welcoming, and even invited me to her lab. Yes. So this is interesting that we are so good at picking up on body language that sometimes we can make assumptions. I do it all the time. 
And we have to be open to having those assumptions overturned. But sometimes what we think of as being closed off may simply be shyness, right? So thank you, Aisha, for that moment. All right, let's see how we're doing. I'm waiting for an update here from Magdalene about whether we can get secret instructions to our moderators. Uh, okay, so I think um, uh, this one, uh, they didn't uh, notice it in the syllabus. Uh, so, uh, yes, okay. you, you can grab it quickly, right? I believe I can. Okay, perfect. So let me get over here. I'm gonna get out of Zoom quickly and see if I can pick up these secret instructions. Thank you everyone for your patience as we work this out. All right, let's see. Okay, here we go. So I'm wondering how best to send this to you, Magdalene. Maybe you can send to each moderator uh, directly from the chat here. Okay, let me see if I can do yes, that. Yes, I was just going to say so. All right, let's see. All right, so I'm going to go back into Zoom. Let's see what time is it? Twelve twenty-nine. Okay. All right, I think it might take me a while to send it to each of the moderators, but let's see if I can do it. I need to organize some things on my screen here so I can get to it. All right, I think that that would take me quite a while to do. So I think I'm gonna change up a little bit and we're going to do this exercise as a big group, if that's all right with everybody. It will essentially be the same. So what I would need now to work things in this new way is someone who would be willing to be our speaker. And this person will need to tell a story about an enjoyable event that they attended recently and they'll need to talk for probably about three or four minutes. So would anyone like to volunteer to be our speaker? Everyone is hiding on Zoom. Any speaker volunteers? It is talking about something you already know, so. Maybe Dr. Christina. You are volunteering, Dr. Christina. Dr. Christina, would you be willing to be our speaker? I'm trying to focus my my mind to get something eventful, but I I couldn't I couldn't find something something till now to be speaking about this for a long time. <laughs> All right. Anyone else, as Dr. Christina is thinking of an enjoyable event. Would anyone else be willing to be our speaker? Oh, Iman, how kind of you. Excellent, thank you very much. That is very kind. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, uh, actually I'm like, uh, I'm not organized, but uh, I wanna like to move on and uh, in our session. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. No problem. So okay. I'm going to turn on my timer here and I'm going to set the timer up for three minutes. So for the next three minutes, will you please, in English, will you please tell us a story of an enjoyable event that you recently attended? Go. All right, okay. So uh, last August, and August uh, 31st, uh, I went to um, an Islamic conference in Toronto and uh, the uh, the main speaker of this conference was Omar Suleiman. 
he lives in US and uh, the conference was um, focused on uh, the title of the conference is like waves of it changes mm. and uh, it was mainly focused on the like uh, the incidences and the events in the Middle East, especially like Palestine and uh, this is tough. Uh, there were like lots of speakers from North America uh, focusing on uh, the same topic uh, and delivering like different lectures. Um, so like uh, I found like each lecture has a different theme focusing on different points. Uh, and they are like, um, uh, they have the, the idea of it, of like um, to have big changes in your life, you have to start with yourself. Mm. So, and how to do that from different perspectives. Uh, I enjoyed the day very much. Like uh, I went with a group of my friends. They are actually friends and neighbors at the same time. And uh, like um, uh, we found like some activities and some uh, like uh, organizations uh, advertising themselves in the lobby of the hotel where the conference was held. Uh, also, at the same day, like we went and the rest of the, in the conference, we went for for a lunch outside the conference uh, building, or um, and uh, there it was there was like um, a Chinese festival at the same time in the downtown. Yeah. So there were like <laughs> different stuff, like um, some like halal food and the Chinese food at the same time. Chinese were like uh, you know have some of their wearing weird or like nice beautifully like dressed in uh, their costumes, uh, different colors, yellow and red and all of this stuff. They have different activities. Uh, and then after we finished our lunch, we went back <laughs> to the conference. Um, there were like uh, also like uh, lots of uh, other stuff uh, were uh, sold in the conference, like T-shirts uh, with the with the Palestine flag, and uh, some organizations like uh, asking people for voting to cease fire, like, like through like um, barcodes and. The, yeah. And uh, yes, that's it. That's, that's three minutes. Okay. Thank you, Iman. That was Thank so you. Great. Thank you. We did it. Okay. For being so brave and for diving in. I very much appreciate that. Yay. Everybody is putting okay. up little clapping hands. I appreciate that very much. And also, that conference sounds very interesting. Uh, there's my timer telling me that we're done. So, what I did while Iman was speaking is I tracked something called vocal fillers. And let me describe to you what vocal fillers are and the very important purposes that they serve in human communication. Across all cultures, across all languages, even in sign languages, exist these things called vocal fillers. And vocal fillers are any sound or any word that does not carry meaning. So these include things like uh, um, ah, uh, or repeated words. For example, in the US, one of the favorite vocal fillers is the phrase, you know, we say it constantly. I was walking down the street, you know, and I thought, I'm gonna get a coffee, you know? So I went into this cafe, you know, a cafe, and constantly. Every single human uses vocal fillers. The only people who do not are either people who cannot speak or people who have deliberately and consciously trained themselves out of vocal fillers. So what I did as Iman was speaking was simply track the number of vocal fillers that she used and the type of filler that she prefers. Now, let me say, if you are speaking in any language that is not your first language, you will use more vocal fillers. So I am a student of French. When I speak French, I use twice as many vocal fillers as when I speak American English. So if I asked Iman to do this in her first language, the number of vocal fillers would be very different. If I asked her to do this in her fourth language, the amount of vocal fillers would be very, very different. So I want to acknowledge right now that I asked her to do this in English, and that was very brave of her. So if every single culture and every single language uses vocal fillers, they must serve a very important purpose. So let me ask you, 
What purposes do you think that a vocal filler could serve? Why do we use them? Uh, I think uh, when we don't have a flow of our, our thoughts, we, we need to take this uh, time, seconds, to have the other idea or to search for appropriate word. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Aisha. So the idea that we need a moment to think and the vocal filler buys us time in which to think of our next idea. We have a couple of comments here. Uh, Marma says, gives you some time to arrange your ideas. Aliyah says, we think while speaking. Absolutely. I know, Reem, you had your hand up. Did you have something else to share? Yeah, maybe to make the person I'm talking to still with me and uh, it's it's still my turn to finish my sentence. It's not his turn yet. Yes. To... <laughs> yes, and this is very relevant if we happen to be in what I call an interrupting culture. Mm -hmm. So in different cultures, you are either allowed and encouraged to interrupt while someone is speaking, or you are discouraged from an interruption. In interrupting cultures, we may use vocal fillers so that someone else does not talk over us. We're not done yet. I'm going to finish. I'm going to use vocal fillers to hold the floor until I finish my thought, and then you can speak. Christina, what do you think? I think in some occasions, it may be some text, the one is always accustomed to say, uh, or, mm, or uh, do you hear me, or do you understand me while he's speaking? even if he is speaking at his own. Well, certainly, absolutely. And I think that we all get into vocal habits. I know that I am constantly aware of my, my vocal habits as an actor. And there are times when a director will say, I need you to change this habit, it's distracting. And then I will study and I will change this habit. So absolutely, some of it is habitual. And like I said, everyone uses vocal fillers. So, um, Iman, please do not be embarrassed that you use vocal fillers. We all do it. And I will say more about that in a moment. So Marmer says, sometimes we may need vocal fillers to allow small breaks between different items to give time for listeners to focus. Absolutely. So what I noticed when Iman was speaking, I counted about 45 vocal fillers oh. and which is that is not bad at all sometimes i have counted 106 i'm not even kidding <laughs> in three minutes so your favorite ones this time in english are a uh, um ah uh, and eh. those are the okay. ones that you use what was very interesting to me you use no repeated words and that's remarkable most of the time people will say well well, or okay, or right. You did not use any repeated words. And you had just a few of your favorite vocal fillers. And I think if we had done it in a different language, like I said, completely different number of vocal fillers, different vocal fillers yeah. that would be your favorites in different languages. So the other thing that vocal fillers can do in addition to what everyone has already offered is they can allow us sometimes to soften disagreement. So if I am giving feedback to a student and what I want to say is your thesis is not good, I can soften that opinion by saying, well, your thesis is not good. The vocal filler of well, which actually carries no meaning, softens the overall message. So as we can see, vocal fillers come in extremely handy. We all use them. Every human on the planet uses them. But they can have some negative effects. So now let's talk about that. What negative effects do you feel that too many vocal fillers could have? Pardon me, Christina? I feel like they are sometimes distracting, distracting to the listeners. They can be distracting to the listeners. And I'm sure some of us have seen in big lectures, 
if a teacher has a particular vocal filler they use over and over, students will actually keep track of how many that they're saying. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so they're clearly not listening to the content, they're listening to the vocal filler. So Honey says, can make the talk boring. Absolutely. Reem, what do you think? I, I think it's uh, other than the, what, what, what uh, Iman was doing, she's uh, talking about something uh, enjoyable. But if you are uh, doing a lecture or something or in a conference, it's not uh, professional. And I remember that I was doing a rehearsal in front of my son, who is much, much better uh, English speaker than myself. And he uh, just noted that I'm 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 saying um 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 and uh, and I, and I have to keep it in my mind to remove the um from be in between, and he said that it's not professional. It's interesting that a few vocal fillers I think can make us appear human, casual, familiar, intimate. It can work in our favor, but if we have too many vocal fillers. There's a series of things that can occur. One is it can make, they can make us appear uncertain of what we're saying, perhaps ill-prepared, or it can make it seem like we don't know our content when we probably do know our content very well. Sometimes too many vocal fillers can break up our thoughts so that listeners have a hard time following what we're saying. And as we said earlier, they can distract. I have worked with some professors over the years at Famer who have so many vocal fillers that even I cannot follow what they're saying. And I am a communication professional. So that is necessary to get rid of every single vocal filler. We would sound like robots. We don't want to sound like robots. We want to sound like human beings. Before I go forward, I see, Iman, that your hand is raised. Did you want yeah, to make a comment? Sometimes when we have a time frame for our talk, we feel more stressed. Yeah. I need to, and the ideas are like flying from my head. I need to like keep them, capture them to say that. So like um, when I try to remember what I'm going to say from stress, uh, I fill in the gaps like with the vocal fillers. Absolutely. As you, as you mentioned, like, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that observation. Yes. Yeah, so... So some vocal fillers are natural. We need them. Audiences like them because it shows them that, look, we are humans too. But too many can be a problem. So here's the question. How do we train ourselves out of vocal fillers when they are largely unconscious? This is a big challenge. So I have a couple of ideas, and this is going to lead us into our final content section for the day. The first idea is this, in some situations, I would encourage you to simply take a moment to think, a moment of silence. Now, if you have a crazy class, they are all undergraduates, they are all 19 years old and they're restless and they're not paying attention, perhaps you cannot take a moment of silence, I understand. But if you are in a more calm and controlled setting, I encourage you to experiment with giving yourself permission to take a moment of silence to think. And I just did it three times in a row. That moment of silence can be very, very small, but it has a lot of advantages over vocal fillers. For one, if you give yourself permission to take a moment of silence to gather your thoughts, one of the things that happens is that we, the communicator, can feel less rushed and less anxious. The moment of silence can actually reassure us and give us more confidence as the speaker. Another thing that happens is we can enjoy the process of formulating our thoughts, not be anxious about it, Enjoy the process. Another thing that moments of thoughtful silence can do is they can so silence as vocal fillers. There will be more vocal fillers in your language than there would ever be moments of silence. So the moments of silence will not break up your thoughts. 
the way the vocal fillers might. But most of all, what interests me about taking thoughtful moments of silence is what they do for learners. The first thing they can do, and I have seen this with my own eyes, this is not something I thought of outside of experience. I've watched this happen. Those moments of silence can be a relief to learners. Learners process what you just said in the moment of silence. The other thing I've seen happen is if I, as the lecturer, as the professor, give myself permission to take moments of silence, my students begin to do it too. They mirror moments of silence. I am modeling for them the principle of taking time to respond with care. So to, to summarize, if you feel that you have many vocal fillers when you are giving a lecture, delivering a talk. One way to work on those vocal fillers is to begin experimenting with moments of silence. The second way to get rid of some of those vocal fillers is a self-study program. And that's what I wanna show you now in our last couple of moments. So I'm going to come here and share my screen again. And we'll get rid of our old slide here. This is a very simple, straightforward self-study program that I use myself. I've used this with famer faculty and fellows for the past 15 years. And surprisingly, it really works. So it only has three steps. The first step is at the top, prepare. I encourage you to choose a class where you really like the students, you feel very comfortable with them where you feel very in command of your content. Let us say this is a class that you have taught for years. Choose a class that becomes your communication laboratory. Then choose one skill, only one communication skill. So for example, let's say, I want to work on not crossing my arms in front of the group. I want to keep my limbs open. So I choose one class and one skill. That's step number one. Step number two, I teach the class, but I focus on that skill only two times during the class. And the way that I like to do this is I actually write it in my notes or I put it on my slides. So I'll just write arms about a third of the way through the class. And then again, in my lesson plan, I'll write arms about two thirds of the way through the class. So the two times during teaching that class, I focus on my communication skill. Then at the end of the class, I move on to step three. As I'm heading to my next class, going back to my office, I debrief. What went well? Was I able to uncross my arms? Did How long was I able to keep my arms loose and open before I went back to crossing them? What could I improve? That's it. Three steps, prepare, teach, debrief. People will say to me, how often should I do this? I say maybe twice a month. It does not have to be often because what happens is this heightens my awareness of my overall communication style. And I begin to think about it outside of this self-study program. This is just a way of keeping it in the front of my mind. It's tiny micro lessons over time, and that can change communication habits. So you can also supplement this self-study program, as we all know, in many, many different ways. One way you can supplement it is you can videotape yourself. Watch yourself, watch yourself for one or maybe two communication skills. Gather the information you need. See if you can make changes. Never do that right before you lecture. Never, never, never. Or you will go into your lecture and you'll have all sorts of things in your head. I recommend doing that again, not more than once or twice a month so that it doesn't ruin anything 
that it only helps you. Another thing that many famer folks like to do, and I'm sure some of you have done this, is they ask a peer to come into their class, observe them, and watch for one particular communication habit. And be very strict with your peer. I don't want feedback about anything but this one habit. And that's another way. Of course, you can always study videos online. You can read books about communication. But what I have learned is the way to change a communication skill is short lessons over time. So before we summarize, come to the very end of our time together, what questions or observations do you have? Iman, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to reflect on uh, uh, what you were saying. Um, like during COVID, we all uh, practiced uh, uh, recording the lectures at home because the lectures were like uploaded on the platform of the university. Yes. So I was like listening to my recording after finishing and uh, I found lots of like um, bad, <laughs> I don't know what to say, it, but like uh, awful communication skills. Uh, sure. Sometimes like, <laughs> about myself and uh, I used to like stop the recording, repeat the recording and found out I repeat the, 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 the same piece of information many times and that's boring, okay? So this is what like something I found. So it's, it's good like to uh, record for ourselves and then uh, like listen to, um, to see like, um, uh imagine like uh, usually we are delivering the content but we never see ourselves how we deliver this content how we how we talk how we communicate with others absolutely so, so during covid it was like a good experience for me <laughs> yes i appreciate that and i think it is very shocking to see yourself on video it yeah. takes a while to get over that so i really do recommend that people don't do it often if you're going to do it don't do it more than two times a month and make sure you have short lessons, right? right? So you don't overwhelm yourself. We are trying to consciously change an unconscious process. So little micro lessons every now and then is the way to do it. Uh, anyone else have any comments or questions about this idea of self-study to change communication habits? Um, is it possible to ask about the inconsistency of message between a verbal and nonverbal body language. How? Absolutely. Um, Tell me more about that, Aisha. Um, I, I'm asking um, how we can be aware about it. Uh, I mean, what happened uh, with me in Tunis in last conferences, um, it yes. was really a wrong assumption from my uh, side but this is what I felt and what I saw. Maybe she was in the context, if we say she was busy, maybe she was ill, I don't know. But the second day, it was good. I mean, for me to be a good, um, appreciated by others, what I can do. So are you asking, how can you adjust uh how you receive information from another person, how you interpret that, or are you asking about the mixed messages that you might send yourself? About myself, because now the lesson was clear for me. I have to give second chance and to realize it uh, or in the context. So yeah. I will not take the first impression. And this is, it was a very valuable lesson for me, but for me, how to provide a consistent message. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I think that one of the best ways to do this is through videotaping oneself. And again, I think it should only happen a couple times a month. But what is very interesting to me, and I have done this repeatedly as an actor, I videotape myself and then I'm very strict with myself. I am only watching for an inconsistent message. When my voice, my face, my body are doing different things, I'm going to let everything else just slide right by me. And I focus on that and I watch the video and I begin to understand my own habits. That I think is the best way to address inconsistent messages because we are so tuned in to receiving body messages from other people 
that when we watch a video of ourselves, if we are able to stay very calm and very focused, we'll start to see the inconsistent message. Oh, in this moment, I was trying to be non-threatening to the student who was speaking. So I, I closed my arms over my chest and I stepped back. But I now see in the video that looks like I'm not interested. I see. So that's what I would recommend. Does anyone else have any advice for how to, yeah. how to make sure that your body and voice are doing the same thing? Yeah, I think it's a good idea to practice with uh, a professional and sincere person. Because I saw like um, there was a, a colleague in the department and he got like a, a faculty position in a university and he was working for that for five years. I know his personality is not like that much like confident, but he like keep uh, practicing. Actually, he applied for this position in different universities and every time he got rejected. And from the rejection, he was learning like lots of lessons about mm -hmm. his application and his PI like has like something like personal sessions, how to practice your talk. Yes. So that's very important. How to stand, how to use your hands, uh, how to start the the like a close in um or idea in a new slide. So yes. all of that by practice with a professional person. Yes, that is yeah. very good advice. It is much easier for us to see body messages in another person than in ourselves. Yes. So having any kind of outside perspective is very useful, whether that is a peer, a professional, or a video. Anything that helps us step outside of ourselves and observe ourselves, very useful. Thank you everyone for participating so thoroughly, so sincerely in this workshop. We are now done. You have one more lesson to do in this session. It will take you 10 to 15 minutes. In that final lesson, which you will find on Moodle, I want you to assess your own communication challenges and strengths. Really try to be honest. What are you good at and what do you need to work on? Then I'd like you to brainstorm how you might use any of the information in this session in your own home environment. If something intrigues you, steal it, take it, use it, make it your own. That's one of the things that Famer really values is the exchange of information among colleagues. Take anything that's useful and make it your own, use it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to Magdalene and Shaima and Hekmat in Zainab. I appreciate your excellence. You can always contact me through your administrators if you have further questions or concerns. It was a joy to be with you today and I hope I see you very soon. Thank you. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.